presets. Uh, so we're continuing this theme of it's not about being good. Uh, and tonight we're going to be looking at the creative mind and then at the second preset in a bit more detail. Um, so during the talk, it's not just going to be a flat talk all the way through to tea time. There'll be some questions, there'll be some space for questions. So if there's anything that's not clear or you want to explore further, um, feel free to ask. We're well aware that this is a mixed ability group, as it were, that some people are relatively new, some people might be brand new, some people have been doing this for years and years and years. Um, so if any of you are relatively new and there's anything that's not clear, please don't be embarrassed about asking. No question is a bad question. Um, being confused is much worse than having not asked a question. Um, so please feel free, that's what we're here for. Um, so we'll just get going, the creative mind in the second preset. <clears throat> so I was thinking about this in ethics in general from my own experience. And when I first came along and sort of discovered ethics or started hearing the word ethics, my mind in a microsecond went from ethics to morality to commandments to there being no fun. And then there was a sense of slump. So my experience just kind of fell. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's like that for you, but it took me a long time to, in a way, get over that. Uh, I was brought up through a kind of Christian background. So anything to do with morality or ethics just immediately meant thou shalt not do something. And that something was probably quite fun in a way. Therefore, <laughs> not being able to do it just kind of meant something slightly doer, slightly um, yeah, downcast, downbeat. It had a very kind of down feeling to it. Ethics meant your whole experience slumped, it sank. Um, so what we want to do through this course, in particular this evening, is to explain how that's not the correct way uh, to approach Buddhist ethics. We need to get over the slump and we need to be moving towards more of a peak. That's what we need to be moving towards. So we need to move away from the idea of ethics as some sort of task, like having to go shopping or do the dishes, uh, or I'm moving away from the idea of ethics has been something in a way that's done to us, that somebody, some power says, thou shalt do this or not do that, whether we want to or not. So we need to be moving towards the whole concept of ethics as being something that we voluntarily sign up to and something that we move towards because we don't want what we're moving away from. The Buddhist path and the spiritual path is very much a path of movement towards and movement away from. So it could be movement away from suffering, movement towards happiness. And we need to be clear about what we're moving towards and what we're moving away from. And they need to be in balance. We need to have a, an awareness and a balance of these, the sense of movement. <laughs> The positive formulation, as we learned last week, the Buddhist precepts have both positive and negative presentations, quite unusually. I'm not an expert in world religion, uh, but I certainly know Christianity didn't have any positive formulation of the commandments. Um, Buddhism has them in both forms, and they can both be helpful. But the most helpful, in the vast majority of cases, is the positive formulation. The positive formulation of the precepts gives us something that we can work with. It gives us something, um, it gives us a direction of travel, as it were, because we can look at the positive formulations and we will be looking 
but the positive formulation of one of the precepts. We looked at them generally last week when Sadaraja introduced all five. Uh, we'll be looking at one in a bit more detail this evening. And we'll be able to see how it can unfold in ever more subtle ways and in ever more helpful ways and in ever more creative ways for us to express that precept and for that to become expressed through us and in a way affect the world around us, affect people around us. So in a way, the positive formation of the Buddha's precepts, they're about moving towards leading a life that attracts us, the life that we want to be leading. And you could say that they're, they're about moving towards leading a beautiful life. And they're certainly about moving towards leading a much more creative life. They are infinitely creative and designed to be so. In a way, at this point, it reminded me, um, I don't know if all of you are familiar with the four sights of the Buddha. So it's a metaphorical story. We have no idea if this is historical accuracy or not. But metaphors can still be very informative. So the four sights of the Buddha were old age, sickness, death, and a wandering mendicant, as is known, or basically a monk, um, as we would know. Now, obviously, this wasn't a Buddhist monk because the Buddha wasn't yet the Buddha. But it was a monk of some sort of spiritual uh, pathway. So the Buddha, in various, we don't need to go into it in too many details, in various trips out from the palace where the Buddha was living in ancient India, he saw old age sickness and death which he had been somewhat shielded from. And these gave him an idea of the suffering of life. He had a very deep uh, response to that suffering, that what is the point of life if all you do is grow old, get sick, and then die? What is the point of it all? Why are we here? That kind of existential questioning, which I'm sure anybody who's been brave enough to come from the outside world, across the threshold of those doors over there and into here has some resonance with. It will be slightly different and it will be different details for different people, but we will all have some sort of resonance with that existential question of what, what is the point of life? Um, otherwise we wouldn't be here. People would still be out in the street or they'd be at home watching EastEnders or doing what they do. But people who have come in here have that to some degree. You'll all know, I'm sure, you'll all recognise what I'm talking about. I know for me personally, precisely what I'm talking about. But then the Buddha saw his fourth sight, uh, which is the wandering mendicant. And in a way, that was his light bulb moment. He thought, well, there is an answer. There is something. There was something about that mendicant which thought, which said to him, that is the answer. And a huge part of what that wandering monk was doing was to try to lead an ethical life. We don't know what the structure of his ethics were, but we know that he was leading an ethical life. All spiritual followings or all spiritual traditions at their base have some structure of ethics. And there was something about that shown from that man who knew nothing about the young man who was observing him from his horse or chariot or wall or whatever he was. He was just going about his life. Something about him shone out and, as it were, catapulted the Buddha onto his path of Buddhahood, onto his search. So there's something really, really profound about practicing ethics effectively. And indeed that's what, you know, so the Buddha went on and discovered what he discovered and his formulation of ethics is what we are trying to, to teach and absorb and follow two and a half thousand years later. Um, so one of the things that's quite key to understand about the positive formulation of the Buddhist precepts, the five precepts, 
is that they're not static. So you could kind of con I'll contrast them with the Christians. I don't know nothing against Christians. It's just it's the only thing I, I know anything about. So you could contrast them with the kind of Christian commandments of, um, you know, thou shalt not kill. So you might arrive home after work or in the evening and think, but I didn't kill anybody today, so that's a plus. Um, <laughs> and then it is a plus, you know, the family's going to be there if, if, you know, if, you didn't, if you manage not to kill somebody. Um, but it's not, it's not really, uh, it's not really what it's about. You know, it's not just about taking that fairly literally from a Buddhist perspective and saying, I didn't do that, therefore I'm ethical, therefore full stop. That's not the way it works in Buddhism. So if you take the kind of Buddhist equivalent of that, which is the first precept, which was mentioned last week. So for those of you who aren't here, in its negative formulation, the, uh, the first precepts are that um, you should abstain from harming living beings. Now already, that's much wider than don't kill them. Um, don't harm a living being. Well, you can unpack the word harm and the ways in which harm can be done for quite a while. And in its positive formulation, it says with deeds of loving kindness, with deeds of loving kindness, I purify my body. The all end with I purify something. Body, speech, and mind, basically. So again, that's not very prescriptive. It's quite wide and deliberately so. So we can think about how many deeds of loving kindness did you do today? If you think back on your day, how many deeds of loving kindness can you take off? <laughs> And another equally interesting way of thinking about the precepts and really getting into their depth and subtlety is how many deeds of loving kindness could you have done today but didn't? So how many opportunities did you have to be kind to somebody, to help somebody, and for whatever reason, you were busy, you thought, well, if I do it this time, they'll only want it next time, and chose not to. So if we think about the precepts in these terms, then we really start to get to the depth and subtlety of them and how they can affect the way that we are in the world. So we could say that reflection and practicing and deepening our understanding of the precepts gives our life a direction of travel. It gives our life a direction of travel towards enlightenment, ultimately, towards becoming more like a Buddha, or in more mundane or simple terms, towards becoming the sort of person that we all think we can be. Again, that's why we're here. We all think that this, the way we are now, is at some level unsatisfactory, and that actually we can be better, that there's a better Kulaprina, that there's a better Amara Chandra, and we just need to work towards being that better person. So at a most simple, mundane level, the precepts are about moving towards that person who knows inside you, but for whatever reason is always somehow suppressed. At a more transcendental level, it's moving towards enlightenment. It's moving towards emulating the Buddha and moving towards enlightenment itself. But often in these classes, you know, a mundane direction is more than enough for now. And in a way, we have to kind of reach the point where the practicing the precepts becomes something that inspires us. So they move from being something that in a way slightly crushes us 
and makes us feel slightly deflated when we think about them. But actually, we absorb them and we see them as something really inspirational. That really, if I absorb and practice and manifest these precepts as best I can, then you have faith that your life will become more creative, become more beautiful, and one that you will be more satisfied living. So if we think about the kind of fullest manifestation of the precepts, then we have to think about the Buddha, uh, the Buddha himself, who, who achieved enlightenment. And the Buddha acted constantly out of a full understanding and manifestation of these five precepts all of the time. So he just imbued and expressed these precepts in his being constantly. And in a way, what's, what's the difference between us and the Buddha? You know, why could he do it and he struggle so much? But I think there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the Buddha got out of the way. The Buddha had no ego clinging. So the Buddha never questioned why he should act ethically or why he was acting in terms of, well, if I do it now, I'll have to do it every time this situation arises, therefore I won't. Or if I do that, uh, it might make me look slightly vulnerable. If I do that, it might make me look slightly less than the status I feel I'm entitled to. The Buddha did not think in terms of what's in it or not in it for him. He was not in the equation because he had gone beyond ego clinging. So one of the things that's quite key in, in ethics is that we get in the way. And one of the things that's quite key in practicing ethics is it helps us get out of the way kind of paradoxical. The more we practice, the more we realize that actually it's not us. We don't need to be in the equation of a deed of loving kindness or of generosity. We just do. We just do. And more than we just do, again, thinking about the Buddha, we respond. There's a key thing about ethics in that ethics are responsive. They're responsive to situations that are constantly arising around us and in front of us and situations that we can respond to. Um, so in that way, that's kind of constant responsiveness and creativity uh, meant that the Buddha led a very, very creative life and had very creative solutions to things that uh, came up around him. So last week, we heard about the story of Kisagotin. Um, not everybody, I don't think, was here last week. So I'll quickly recap if you're not familiar. So uh, Kisagotin is one of the stories from the Pali Canon, so it's quite an old story. Uh, Kisagotin was a, a woman in uh, ancient India, the time of the Buddha, uh, who had a child and the child died. And Kisagotami was overcome with grief as one you know, can very easily imagine. But so overcome with grief, she couldn't accept that her child was dead. So she was carrying this dead child around desperately trying to find a solution that would make her child well. She couldn't accept death. So she was eventually uh, put uh, or advised to go and see the Buddha. She came to see the Buddha and the Buddha immediately saw the desperation of this woman. So whilst we would automatically kind of think, 
or when you just sit them down and you just give them a lecture about the universality of death, the inevitability of death, that's the human condition, it inevitably ends in death. That's not what he did. That's not what he did. That wouldn't have helped. The woman's state of mind was so clouded, she wouldn't have been able to receive that teaching. True as it is, it would not have landed. So instead, what the Buddha did was ask, he said, well, I will be able to help your child, which is a surprising response, given that it was dead. But he said, what I need is a mustard seed, or some mustard seeds, which are very common in Indian cooking. Uh, but I need some mustard seeds from a house that has not been visited by death. So if you go to the village, knock on the doors, ensure that that house has not been visited by death, then ask them for some mustard seeds, bring me the mustard seeds, then I'll be able to help. So Kisigo to me left delighted, um, absolutely delighted. She thought she had found the solution to her insolvable problem. And she went to the local village and she knocked on doors and said, the Buddha said he'll help me cure my child. I just need some mustard seeds, so long as the house has not been visited by death. And every door she knocked on, she had the same response. Well, we have lots of mustard seeds, but I'm sorry, they're not going to help because we have been visited death by death in this household. And she heard this over and over and over again. And as time went on and the disappointment mounted, she slowly realized her child was dead and that all of these houses and all of these people that she had spoken to had had to accept that death visited their household, their family. And so the penny dropped and she accepted that her child was dead. So she went back to the Buddha and said that she realized her child was dead, her child was dealt with in a traditional way, and uh, she became a follower of the Buddha. So in a way, that was a great deed of loving kindness. A deed of loving kindness uh, expressed through incredible creativity, incredible awareness and responsiveness to the situation that was in front of the Buddha. If it had been somebody else, the Buddha would probably have given quite a different response. He would have responded differently because his response was directed by the situation in front of him, by the set of conditions to which he was responding. And they are never the same twice. So it's not like every time somebody came to the Buddha with an ill or a dead child that they were asked to collect some mustard seeds. That was a solution, a creative solution, a deed of loving kindness that gave a very profound teaching, very kindly, to somebody and when there was just what they needed. That was the only teaching they were going to be able to understand. In a way, it made me think uh, that the precepts, in a way, they're like, if our life's a boat, that the precepts are the rudder. So if you're a sailor, um, you know, you're aware, not that I am, but anyway, uh, if you were, I'm sure you're aware that, you know, if you're in a sailing boat, you know, you have to be constantly responsive. You know, the waves are going to change, the tide's going to change, the weather's going to change. All sorts of things are going to change constantly and quite unpredictably. And you have to be ready to respond. Otherwise, your boat's going to get into trouble. So if you want to get from your, if you're going from, I don't know, Dover to Cali, you know, you know you're going east. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you can set off east. But each time you do that, you might do that generally a hundred times. 
the rudder is going to be moving in different ways every single time you do that journey. And in a way, there was something similar struck me about our ethical responses. It's almost like the ethics are the rudder by which we sail through our lives. So we're constantly presented by a different set of conditions that demand some sort of responsiveness from us when we want to act positively. So the positive precepts, in a way, ask us to be doing something about the situation around us. So we're constantly being presented by new and novel and different sets of conditions. And we have to respond positively to them using the rudder. They're never going to be the same twice, just like a sailor will never sail exactly the same route between point A and point B. We'll be constantly modified by the conditions around us. So um, negativity, that negative attitude, we don't want to let it go because there's something of us invested in it. So these changes can be scary. Now, I remember uh, a couple of, uh, sort of personal anecdotes. Many, 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 many years ago, uh, I don't think I discovered Tree Ratna at that point. I think I may just only have had some vague notion that I might be interested in Buddhism. Uh, I had a, um, I was having some painting done in my house, I didn't live in Cambridge, and my painter was Buddhist. So I would have a wee chat to my painter before I went to work when he came in, or if he was still there when I got back, uh, about things. He followed, he didn't follow the Ratna tradition. It was some sort of Tibetan tradition, I think. Anyway, he told me, he was a lovely, lovely man. Uh, he said to me one day that uh, somebody from his tradition, a monk, was going to be coming and giving a talk at a friend's meeting house. So a Quaker meeting house. The Quakers are great friends of the Buddhists. There are so many mm -hmm. Buddhist activities take place in friends meeting houses. Um, so I thought, well, that's interesting. So I went along to listen to this Tibetan monk. Thank you, Tibetan. Um, who was an incredibly, uh, yeah, it was an incredibly attractive man. Um, there was something really magnetic about him. Um, even though I knew nothing about what was going on, I really remember feeling, gosh, there's something stunning about this human being, about this man. Maybe in the same way that the Buddha might have thought about the fourth side, something really magnetic. Now, the thing was, he wasn't talking about ethics. As far as I recall, I was trying to remember, it was over 20 years ago. Um, I think he was talking about stress and why there was no point to stress. Because if you just go from moment to moment to moment, stress is always something that's kind of somewhere in the future. It's a projection of our kind of what a storyline of our minds. Um, and therefore, if you just drop the what if and stay in the moment to moment to moment, there's absolutely no point in stress. I think that was kind of the crux of what he said. Um, so there's something very, very magnetic about him. It didn't really matter what he said, we just have sort of fell with sort of slightly agog. But afterwards, we broke up into little groups. Uh, and I was in a group with some people that I'd never met before. And I remember there was a lady in the group who I think somebody must have said, you know, they thought that this man was really quite inspirational which he was, um, and that maybe, I don't know, something like, you know, they really wanted to be a bit more like that. Um, and this lady, and she was a lovely lady, uh, she said she didn't want to lose stress or her stress. She might have wanted to tone it down a bit, but there was something for her about her anger, her stress, her depressions, uh, coupled with her happiness, her optimism, you know, all these different positive and negative emotions that for her made her. And that to lose any of them, even the negative ones, she felt scared of. She didn't want to. She was very invested in being that person who had negative emotions, even though they were negative. 
And she must have at some level, having gone to a Buddhist talk, have been interested in at some level working on herself. But she couldn't, she couldn't see that giving anything up was beneficial. She saw it as a loss. And that always struck me. And it came to me when I was sort of thinking about this talk and this particular aspect, that change can be scary and it can be really paradoxical, very, very paradoxical, the things that we become scared of. There are things that we want rid of and we're scared to get rid of them. It's just a complete koan, makes no sense. But I myself, uh, I didn't experience that with the, that particular uh, thing with the Buddhist monk. Um, I did, however, when I came a bit further along the line and kind of made more of a formal commitment to becoming a Buddhist, I did have a fear about what my friends would make of it and whether they would stay my friends. And I thought, well, I don't want to lose my friends. I mean, I was in the process of making new friends who were more Buddhist or uh, involved in the Sangha, but I didn't want to lose the old ones because I'd had them for ages. And it was something about they were kind of supportive to me. So even me, you know, I do get that this fear of change, even positive change, is scary. Um, paradoxical as it is, I know it's there. Um, and many of you may well encounter it. And you're not alone. Don't be afraid of mentioning that or talking to anybody about it. Um, everything that anybody goes through is probably not unique. Very few things that people go through are unique. We think we're unique and what we're going through is unique. In fact, it's very rarely unique. So if you are going through something, just talk to one of us about it. We've probably been through exactly the same set of emotions and fears and so on and so forth and can try and help. We're never as unique as we think we are. Um, so in a way, one of the things, uh, one of the kind of the only ways to counter a fear of change is to have something more positive to look towards. So kind of turn it on its head and not think about what's being lost, but think it far more about what's being gained, where you're going and what you're going to gain, not what you're going to lose. And in a way, we need to become more creative. We need to be creative with what's going on um, and creative in our practice of the precept. <clears throat> and I was thinking one of the things that I kind of find really attractive, I mean, I find really attractive, you know, the idea of enlightenment and emulating the Buddha, trying to live my life the way the Buddha did by practicing the precept. But sometimes that can feel just a little bit far away. I can just feel a little bit over the hill. Sometimes I can feel slightly close to it. If I'm on retreat or if I'm in really good conditions, I can feel it slightly closer. But sometimes, you know, if I'm at work, I've had a really busy day today, uh, you know, I can feel like that's so far away. You know, it's just miles away. And I thought, actually, it's nice to have something that's a bit more of a nearer goal or inspiration. And one of the things I was thinking of was that, wouldn't it be lovely to just be the person who always knows the right thing to say? I think, it, wouldn't it be lovely to be the person who might have a friend or a colleague who suffered a bereavement or something? And rather than, which I know I've been guilty of myself, think I should send them a card. I don't know what to say. Oh, I forget the card idea. Uh, or even try and avoid meeting them because you just don't know what to say faced with that level of suffering. I think, wouldn't it be lovely to just be the person who always knows the right thing to say. And isn't it lovely if you're in a group and you experience 
somebody knowing just the right thing to say. They may be saying it to you, depending on what's going on for your life. And it's lovely. If you're suffering in some way or you need something and somebody just knows exactly what that is or what is just the right thing to say. I'm sure we all know how fantastic that feels to receive that or how fantastic that is to witness, to see somebody meeting somebody after a bereavement or whatever, you know, suffering in some way and just knowing what the right thing to see is. And the way we become that person is by as best we can, getting ourselves out of the way and responding to the conditions and the situation in front of us, expressing the positive precepts. That's how we become that person. And then we can become enlightened. Um, yeah, I thought that was quite inspirational to think. And so many examples of where you just feel so moved when you experience it or you witness it. It's very moving. Uh, and it is, that is the precept in action. That's what they do to you. You become the person who knows just what to say. So now for the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so, um, we'll turn to the second precept more specifically. So last week we touched more upon the first precept and I've, I've recapped a bit of the first precept uh, earlier on. But now we're going to turn to the second precept. The second precept in its positive formulation says with open-handed generosity, I purify my body, the end of body, speech, your mind. So generosity is with open-handed generosity. And actually this one, in its negative formulation, I also quite like. Um, the negative formulation of this precept is saying that we should not take the not given. So it roughly equates to thou shalt not steal, one of those Christian commandments that deflates us, but not taking the not given is a much subtler way of saying that. So I'm sure we can all go to our beds this evening quite happy <coughs> that we haven't done any shoplifting. And I hope we can all go to our beds this evening quite happy that we haven't done any shoplifting. Sorry? Not racist. <laughs> so if we were following a, a kind of Christian, thou shalt not steal, that's a tick. Great, plus. If we're following Buddhist precepts and not taking the not given, well, how soundly can we sleep when we think about that one? So not taking the not given, it's much, much, much more subtle. So the not given is more than just taking a good surreptitiously and putting it in your coat or whatever. Um, what about if we think about having borrowed something and not yet given it back? So having borrowed something, um, we've not taken it. We entered into some sort of negotiation with a friend or whoever to borrow the book or the CD or the five pounds or whatever it might have been. But where was the negotiation about how long that bond was valid for? And are there any that were beginning to think, oh, I've had that for ages. These little oh, moments are very instructive for us. They're very instructive of where we're at and how we're doing. So is there anything we've borrowed and not yet given back? Have we taken somebody's time? So have we tried to speak to somebody about something that we consider quite important uh, when they were quite busy or that they were clearly you know, occupied 
somewhere else, or they were just about to leave to go somewhere else. And we said, no, I need to speak to you about it now. Taking somebody's time, have they given you that time? Did you ask if it would be all right to have that time? Taking somebody's time is taking the not given if they haven't said, yeah, that's fine, I've got as long as you like, tell me is what, you know, whatever, that, whatever it is. Taking time is not given. It's not been given. Then we're taking the not given from somebody. Being late. Um, we may have been late for things today. I mean, being late is inevitable. We're all late <laughs> at times. It's inevitable. Uh, if we're consistently late, um, then we are taking the goodwill and the time of everybody else in the meeting. And it might just be one friend that we're meeting. It might be, you know, a work meeting, everybody else who's got their own time. We're taking their time from them because the meeting or whatever can't progress until you're there and you're late. So you've taken something that wasn't actually given to you. So taking the not given, I hope you can see, is a far, far richer and subtler way to kind of wag a finger than just not stealing. So it's much, much, much fuller. And in its positive formulation, it's with open-handed generosity. Open-handed generosity. We're holding nothing back by having our hand open. There's no clenching. Nothing is being held back. How generous have we been today? And in how many ways could we be generous if we really thought about it and reflected on it and acted out of a creative will to express this precept? So here at the Buddhist Centre, for example, we try to express our generosity collectively and as a, as a business, in a way, you know, uh, by running a dana economy. So dana is a kind of Buddhist word for generosity. Uh, so we run a dana economy. So there's no charge for coming this evening. There's no charge for uh, any of our courses where the dharma and meditation are taught. There is a charge for, I think, um, yoga and meditation and different things. But the basic dharma and meditation classes, uh, there is no charge. And that was a change that was introduced in you, so I can't quite remember. Um, fairly recently, the last few years. And it was uh, introduced after a lot of discussion in around ways that the, the uh, precept of generosity could be more fully expressed and exemplified to those who come to the Buddhist Centre. So we're not just talking about these things, you know, as abstracts, you know, as a, as a well, I don't work at the Buddhist Centre, but you know, the Buddhist Centre team um, spent a lot of time discussing and Obviously, it had implications for the, the finances of the expensive building, um, but that risk was taken. It was a creative response to a will to express generosity as fully as possible. And it's been done. It's been done for over a year. And as far as I'm aware, it's working fine. There are no plans for it to change. And we're very proud and very happy that that's the way the Buddhist Centre is run. It's run on the basis of generosity. It's run as a business, but a business expressing one of the Buddha's key precepts, the precept of generosity. So in a way, that's another example of kind of creativity and how when you imbue and reflect upon these precepts, creativity emerges in the different ways that they can manifest, that you can manifest. So there's various other ways that generosity can be expressed. You can express that through your time. You can give your time freely. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm giving my time freely. In fact, it's not free. I feel like I'm being paid because I like doing this. <laughs> so 
excuse me, dry throat. <coughs> when I don't work at the Buddhist Centre, I don't uh, get paid by the Buddhist Centre. There's no payment for anybody who gives talks here on a Tuesday evening. I do it because I enjoy it. I, and it's a way that I can try and express the things that I feel are important in my life and have changed my life and help to influence those, those aspirations of others. We can give our energy so we can help with our energy. If we're more able-bodied, we can help those that are less able-bodied. We can give of our expertise. Um, so if we have an expertise in something or other, we can help to give that to those who don't have that expertise in whatever it might be. I was thinking about this actually in, in sort of some of my work histories. Um, I don't, I work for a Buddhist business at the moment, which is very lovely, but I have worked in kind of corporate industries in the past where it's not so much expertise, but knowledge. Knowledge was power and people would squirrel knowledge away like nobody's business because it gave them power. So knowledge would be squirreled away that maybe if you were collaborating with another team, could be really useful to that other team, was never freely given, so that that knowledge might be expressed in a meeting where the Uber boss was, and they would be, status would be elevated because they knew things that the other people didn't. Um, that was a very common practice to have that kind of um, squirreling away of, of details or knowledge or things that would have been helpful to others but were never shared until the moment was opportune for the person who'd squirreled it away. I'm not sure I ever did that, but then I saw it happen quite a lot. Uh, we can always volunteer. There are lots of opportunities to volunteer. So we can be volunteering all of the above um, for a free basis, helping others. Things like giving blood or being an organ donor, the expressions of generosity, incredibly generous thing to do, to give blood or to you know, be an organ donor where even after you died, you're, you're, you're still able to help somebody. I mean, that's fantastic. That's really moving when you think about it. And the last one before we break up for kind of discussions which I love, uh, and it's a real teaching for me um, in terms of, you know, trying to fully express generosity is don't suppress kind impulses. Don't suppress kind impulses. So how often have we thought about sending a card to somebody or picking up the phone to have a chat and thought, oh, I can't remember I haven't got that time. I, I, you know, I'm in a bit. I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, and then it never happens. As much as we can, and I'm not pointing at anybody in particular about being guilty about these things. As much as we can, these impulses that we have are fantastic. We should feel blessed that they're there. And as much as we can, we should act upon them. And I know it's a big ask to do it every single time, but as much as we can, we should act on kind impulses. They are very, very, where well, they express all sorts of precepts, not just generosity, all sorts of precepts are, are uh, tied up in that one, that I did of loving kindness, uh, as well as being generous to pick up the phone, to ask somebody how they are, to write a little card, so they've just been thinking of you, oh, you're better, whatever it might be. When we have these impulses, as much as possible, try and act upon them. So, oh gosh, a bit longer than I thought. Um, so for the next, uh, oh, I don't know, break into groups for 10, 15 minutes before tea, um, you can say hello or introduce yourselves if you don't know, don't know the people that you're speaking to. Um, just give you a couple of uh, questions to get going, your, get your conversations going with. So one is, 
Do you see an ethical life as a beautiful life? Do you see an ethical life as beautiful? Or do you have some sort of connection with that fear of change? If you don't see it as beautiful, why don't you see it as beautiful? What is it that you fear or you're, you're not seeing? Uh, and if you exhaust that one, <laughs> uh, you can just have a think about in what ways could you personally be more generous? I mean, obviously when we give these talks are very generalised, but in what ways do you think that you personally could be more generous? Either with your family, your friends, at work, neighbours, whatever, whatever. Whatever kind of springs to your mind, what way could you think you could be more generous? It's very helpful to actually kind of concretize that, as it were, by seeing it. Uh, that would help you kind of get to this next stage of actually then doing it. So it's an idea, then we see it, and then that helps us move towards actually doing it. So what for you, do you think, would help?